All right, with today's meeting, I do have to read uh, our long disclosure. So uh, I'll jump to that. Today is uh, August 20th, 2021. I'm joined by uh, Jeff Wagner of Morningstar Investments. Uh, we'll jump right to it with our disclosure. And of course, uh, this will be at the beginning of our video conference and at the end. So if you really wanna read this over, uh, you're certainly welcome to do so and appreciate you being here and uh, viewing the webinar. Lewis Tranquilly is an investment advisor representative of Tranquilly Financial Advisor, LLC. This content is provided for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any type of securities. Neither Mr. Tranquilly nor Tranquilly Financial Advisor LLC and Morningstar Investment Management LLC are responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken as a result of the information provided here and do not warrant or guarantee the accuracy or completeness of the information provided. The information discussed here reflects the views of Mr. Tranquilly, me, and my guest, Jeff Wagner, as of today's date of this show and are subject to change without notice. Clients of Tranquility Financial Advisor, LLC, may hold positions in securities discussed during this video conference. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Any forward-looking statements or forecasts are based on assumptions and, are, and actual results may vary from any such statements or forecasts. No reliance should be placed on any statement or forecast when making any investment decision. Accordingly, viewers should not rely solely on the information provided in this video in making any investment decision. There's a risk of loss from investing in securities, including the risk of loss of principal. Different types of investments involve varying degrees of risk, and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will be profitable or suitable for a particular investor's financial situation or risk tolerance. Asset allocation and portfolio diversification diversification cannot assure or guarantee better performance and cannot eliminate the risk of investment losses. Jeff Wagner is a portfolio specialist at Morningstar Investment Management LLC, a registered investment advisor and a wholly owned subsidiary of Morningstar Incorporated. The Morningstar strategies referred to within this show are offered by Morningstar Investment Management. Diversification and asset allocation are investment methods used to help manage risk. They do not ensure a profit or protect against the loss. Opinions of Morningstar Investment Management are subject to change and are provided for informational purposes only. References to specific securities should not be considered an offer to purchase or sell that investment. Morningstar Investment Management shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to this information, data, analysis, or opinions of their use. This information is for informational purposes only and has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or needs of any specific listener and should not be considered investment advice. Consult a financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Investment Management and its subsidiaries are not affiliated with Tranquility Financial Advisor, LLC. Thank you for sitting through that long uh, disclosure. We're glad to have Jeff with us. Uh, appreciate his time. And, uh, and certainly appreciate all of you being here and uh, we'll get to it. You can do so. And I, I just hit the recording button, Jeff, because I will share with everyone, last time Jeff joined us for an excellent meeting, uh, I did not hit the record button. So today I just hit the record button. So all of that disclosure uh, information will be uh, saved on the recording that will go out. If you're listening to this after uh, as a recording, uh, you can look at the disclosure document. It will be at the beginning. It will be at the end. And you'll hear my uh, wonderful comment about that. I, Jeff, I, we had five minutes set aside for the introductions and the uh, and the uh, the disclosures. And we took exactly that. So let's jump to it. We've, we're going to talk about market tone right now. And that that's a short video that I sent out to clients a few months ago about the tone of the market. So it's, it's really a, a conversation, I'll say that, uh, that hits close to home as it applies to uh, investing, uh, specifically U.S. stocks and bonds, even non-U.S. stocks and bonds. What what Morningstar is looking at right now from a tone of the market. Obviously, we have some recent news politically. Uh, I was just speaking with Andrew about this uh, and the uh, the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. Uh, and regardless of politics, the meaning of of an impact on investments. So if you would give us some some thoughts on the tone of the market, both in U.S.-based stocks and non-U.S.-based stocks, along with bonds. 
Sure. So, you know, it, it is a really sad situation what's going on, uh, you know, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And um, we, I don't really have any comments per se on that. And I, you know, I have not seen the video you posted about that recently. So, you know, feel free to have me expand on a couple of things that I might miss here. But, you know, from Morningstar's point of view, um, and, and broadly speaking, you know, what's on investors' minds uh, right now? Um, you know, we've got the new Delta variant, um, which is, you know, becoming a, a bigger headline. But for the most part, in terms of how it affects the economy and the lockdowns that we saw last year and, and, and all of the, you know, slowdown in economic activity, people, the market in general isn't as concerned about that. Um, you know, when professional money managers have been interviewed, it's not at the top of the list anymore like it was in 2020. Uh, the things that are at the top of investors' minds right now, uh, inflation uh, is probably the, the number one concern. Um, it's a complicated issue. Uh, you know, there was a big slowdown last year. And so when you compare, which inflation numbers usually do, the change in, relative to this same period last year, you know, we call it base effects. Um, of course, you're going to have an uptick in inflation after that slowdown. Um, so prices have spiked generally. There's a number of factors going on here, supply uh, issues, um, you know, wages in the service industry, for example. Uh, but the big question is really, is this transitory? Meaning, is it going to go, is it going to spike and then kind of normalize quickly? Uh, or is it going to have some kind of lasting effect? And so we do have some kind of views on, on that. Um, a related issue uh, would be interest rates. Um, so interest rates right now, even though we, they've come up a little bit uh, from their lows last year, um, you know, they're still at historic lows. And that has all kinds of implications really on the pricing of any asset class. Um, and so that is top of investors' minds. Um, it, when will the Fed start to try and raise rates? By how much and how soon? Um, and so that's going to be a sensitive issue. And, and it is related to inflation. Right, because the Fed will often raise rates to slow down the economy if it gets overheated and so forth. So um, you'll see, often see uh, commentary about those two uh, run in tandem. Um, that's more on the economic front. Um, and in terms of the US stock market, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk. Uh, we've seen spectacular growth in, in equity returns over the past uh, call it year and a half or so since the lows in, in the first quarter of 2020. And one of the shifts that we've seen a little bit more recently is uh, you talk about the value growth story, which, um, you know, the, the more high earnings growth companies really led the market over the past five years and then had this tremendous boost uh, during the, the shutdown last year. Cause a lot of these companies, these tech companies, for example, they tend to benefit from, you know, in-person activities because a lot of these are, you know, e-commerce or um, uh, online focused firms. Um, and so they really benefited from that. Um, and then what we saw towards the end of the year in Q4 and into the first quarter of this year is kind of a rotation from some of those more growth oriented companies to what we call more cyclical or value oriented companies uh, energy and financials, for example. And so um, that's been a big story in uh, financial news. The big question now is, is that we've seen a little bit of a reversion back to, to growth. So will this continue or, or will this, you know, will this rotation continue or will the growth companies uh, continue to dominate? Um, and then lastly, just stop you there for a second. Oh yeah. That, that, so the tone of all of that, what it is the tone continuing shift of of what is if you will the 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 in sector or the in stock uh and i know you're not talking about specific stocks right now uh although uh someone just wrote uh, i think i saw it yesterday that tesla is is no good so we might might be able to talk about that a little bit um but the, the without specific stocks being part of the conversation is the tone of the market that we have a constant shift going on from value to uh, to dividend producing to growth stock. Where are you seeing that tone within Morningstar? Well, so I, you know, it, to put it in perspective, really since the global financial crisis of 0809, 
um, coming out of that. And for not every single year uh, up until the present day, but the vast majority of the period since then, and especially over the past five years or so, uh, growth companies, um, you hear, you know, the Fangham stocks in, in, all the time in, in the media, um, you know, six company names, for example, they've really led the market. Um, uh, and, and, and in fact, if you look at the performance of the, U, the major U.S. large cap index, the S&P 500, um, you know, the returns have been not quite flat, but there's been very little performance out of the S&P 500 if you were to remove those six companies. Mm-hmm. So a vast portion of, their, of, the, of the U.S. market's performance is due to just a handful of companies. And you know, how long can that continue? Um, people try and make justifications for, you know, all sort on, on both sides of the debate. Um, you know, these are some, some of these companies, you know, they're all household names. They're exceptional. They're, they're, um, you know, they, they've really changed the way we interact with each other uh, and with commerce in general. But um, the other side of that argument would be, well, at, at how, how do you, you know, at what price is, are those companies unjustified? Even if they're the greatest companies in the world, you know, they don't have an infinite valuation, right? So Morningstar has, as those growth companies have continued to outperform and outperform and outperform, have been kind of taken the contrarian view to that and looked for other parts of the market um, that might not have as much downside risk um, if things were to change. Um, and that, you know, com- the types of companies or sectors of the market that may not have performed as well on the way up, but do still, uh, in our view, have, have good fundamentals and solid rationale to, to outperform going forward. Okay. And uh, if you would touch on U.S.-based bonds and uh, uh, ex-U.S. bonds uh, as an asset class, and again, the tone of the market, are, are people out seeking those bonds? Inflation concerns, uh, certainly uh, Delta variant, Delta Plus has already been uh, mentioned. If you I haven't if, heard as much about that one, yeah. No, we have not yet. But uh, how's this? as we've come to all be uh, epidemiologists over the last uh, year and a half, uh, you'll start to hear more about Delta Plus. Sure. Uh, so impact on bonds and the tone of, of the markets as it applies to purchasing bonds at this time. Yeah. And, and you know, Equity stocks tend to get a lot more focus um, in, in the markets, of course. Um, but on the bond side, equally important to you know a lot of people's portfolios. Um, I, I guess we kind of you know just breaking out at the first kind of decision level, um, U.S. versus non-U.S. Um, you know, on the U.S. side, you can break things out into Treasuries, um, for example, which are are yielding quite low right now. So we do have, um, you know, a, a lot of our portfolios, especially the more conservative portfolios, will have a healthy slug of exposure to U.S. Treasuries. Um, a lot of that serves as a ballast to the portfolio to protect capital um, uh, on the downside, for example. There's not a lot of yield right now in high quality bonds. Um, so we do try and supplement that with, um, you know, some high yield bond exposure or companies that are, have a little bit lower credit ratings um, in the U.S. Um, and then we also looked outside the U.S., uh, not in the developed markets so much. Um, in fact, we, we have a pretty negative view on um, non-U.S. developed market uh, bonds. You hear of, um, you know, regions like Japan and parts of the Eurozone that have, you know, negative, even nominal rates, not even taking into account inflation. So, we don't find that part of the markets uh, attractive, but we do see uh, areas in emerging market bonds that we do like. Um, they're a bit riskier, all else equal, but the yields are attractive enough that um, we think that it's a fair trade-off uh, for that additional risk. Okay. Interesting, uh, be- because you brought up two, we'll, so, we'll say aging populations uh, in Japan and, and uh, some of those Eurozones. So, uh, it's interesting in that we can't get into that that discussion right now. We don't have enough time for that today. And I didn't promise everybody that we'd keep it to just about 45 minutes or so with Jeff uh, uh, because we want to give you as much as we can, let you know conversations that I'm having. And I do just want to, uh, should have done it at the beginning, uh, but 
define the tone of the market for everyone as, as I see it, which is you'll get into, Jeff men, mentioned it earlier, uh, where it looks like the stock market is going up and up and up, but there are five or six securities that are driving it upward. So that's a tone of the market of uh, the FOMO that a lot of people love to use, the fear of missing out of uh, investing. And we're trying to take a longer term approach to that. And so market tone is really what what momentum, if you will, uh, do you see in the market? And and what it, news news cycle, what what's cycling through the news? And it, then how, how are investors reacting? And I think it's part of our job to uh, be sure that we are keeping uh, a good, a good focus, if you will, on the longer term to not get caught in the immediate tones of the market, even though it's important to know them. Uh, big tech, we, well, and we didn't really speak about uh, GameStop and all that's gone on there, uh, or uh, Robinhood, which they've continued to bounce around. Uh, and I, I mean, I do want to touch on those because I think it's important to touch on each of those two securities. Uh, they're both uh, what I'll say, uh, popular topics of conversation, Jeff. But I think they fit into our, our next discussion, which is a conversation on big technology, the regulation, the administration of it, uh, earnings on, in that sector. And of course, uh, I mentioned Tesla earlier. I, I still would like your, your take on that, um, on that vehicle. So if you don't mind, give us some commentary on the regulation and the administration of big tech and how that, that impacts uh, investing. Sure. Um, uh, it's a pretty, uh, you know, I'll kind of, I'll pick one at a time and kind of try and make yeah, this. Summarize. <laughs> we can go on this all day. I've got a, a webinar that it's for me that I'm spending an hour on yeah. uh, regulation and administration. So. so you mentioned GameStop and Robinhood uh, first. So I'll kind of, I'll handle the, I'll talk a little bit about those first. And, and just as a, a quick disclaimer, um, Neither company are, are, are stocks that we currently hold in our equity portfolios, uh, game, that it would be GameStop and Robinhood. Um, and Robinhood actually just IPO'd very recently um, and has experienced, like you said, a lot of volatility. Um, but, you know, those are both interesting stories to me. And, I, and the GameStop story is, is, has been going on a little bit longer and it's related to Robinhood, frankly, because that's where a lot of the, the younger, uh, more inexperienced investors have really started to um, to show up um, and, and kind of rally behind uh, one or two. You know, I can name a couple other uh, companies in addition to GameStop that that have caught headlines. But you know, generally speaking, this to to me personally and, and to to Morningstar and in, in in general is is a sign of some excesses in the market. Um, I'm not trying to draw a comparison necessarily to the dot com period, um, you know, in in around the 2000s, but um, there are some unavoidable similarities. Um, you know, you see these you know thousand percent plus uh, returns in a, just a, a handful of months uh, that GameStop experienced, um, and you know the backstory there is that you know there was um, some social media. Uh, I guess it's social media, I guess, or it's more of a blog. I won't name it by name, but um, there was uh, a lot of people rallying behind and encouraging other investors to, to buy into to this uh, company. And part of the rationale there was kind of a, uh, kind of a finger in the, in the face of uh, some of the larger um, hedge funds or some large hedge funds that had short interest in GameStop, meaning they were betting on the, on the stock declining. And so as they, those positions moved against those large institutions, they had to unwind, essentially buy it back, and that drove the stock up further. And so it's this kind of self-propelling um, momentum that kind of you know, shot this, this company to the moon. And it's been very volatile ever, ever since that started later this year, but it still sits well above, I haven't looked at the price in a couple of days, but it's well above where it was coming into 2021 still. So it it's an interesting story. And, and the way Robinhood feeds into that is, is like I said, it's, it's, it tend, Robinhood tends to have younger, less experienced investors. Um, and you can buy, I think, fractional shares or maybe just, um, you know, it has kind of like this encouragement when you when you participate and, and buy a stock, it gives you, you know, kind of like a- Confetti comes down when you buy. Yeah, yeah right. And so um, that has kind of fed into, into the excesses in the market in, in our view. And 
On a separate but related topic, um, SPACs. Um, you might have heard that acronym before, but uh, special purpose acquisition companies. Um, you'll hear them referred to as blank check companies, meaning that um, investors who buy into a SPAC don't even know what the company is going to be yet. Um, basically, the people that ha- um, formed the SPAC and seeded the SPAC with m- their own capital, um, when other people invest in that, um, the, the company that the that they're investing in is still TBD at that point. So it's, it's a highly speculative investment, right? You don't even know what you're buying yet. You just kind of place your blind faith in the people running um, that SPAC. And the interesting stats uh, that I've seen, um, the capital raised in just the first quarter of 2021 exceeded all the capital raised throughout 2020. And then 2020 was also a banner year. It exceeded the, the amount of capital raised in SPACs generally in 2020 exceeded the total over the previous, I counted seven years, maybe more. Um, I don't think they've tracked them for that long. But it's been this explosive growth in these blank check companies, um, which to, to, you know, to a lot of investors means that people are really looking for these you know, home runs, if you will, in the market. Um, and that's after uh, the market has, has done very well uh, over the near term. And so, you know, it's not necessarily indicative of any major downturn right around the corner, but it is sign, it, it is to a lot of investors a sign of some excess in the market. All right, Jeff, and I'm going to just jump in there. And again, uh, if, if you haven't watched them, Jeff, they're riveting. I, I record two to three minute videos and uh, one of them was on the SPACs, you know, oh, said, great. not not spam, it's on SPAC, it's SPAC. <laughs> Uh, and it is, it's rather remarkable that it's a, that's a, it's a regulated, if you will, security, but you don't know what you're buying. Uh, and uh, I've equated it uh, to a great uh, tried and true uh, phrase, which is uh, SPACs are a hammer looking for a nail, uh, but they just happen to be people's money looking for something to buy. Uh, and the, the GameStop uh, run up, and there's no other way to put it, uh, is so reminiscent of pets.com. I just, I cannot stop comparing the two of them. Uh, there are no profits yet. There is this, this remarkable, uh, amount of, of, uh, valuation increase within the stock itself. So it, it, again, it, it leads to some caution on my part of it, which I'll, I'll say, uh, if you would touch just for a minute on administration of all of this, what, what, what does the SEC look like and, and feel like as it applies to, to all of these different acronyms that for the uh, seasoned investors that are on this video conference now and those listening later, the SPAC is a new term. That's all there is to it. Uh, certainly Robinhood is a, uh, is, is, is a really bad movie that's been made over and over again, but they just keep making it. Uh, but no, now it's a, a stock trading application. So uh, what, what, how, do, how do the regulators handle this? Yeah, you know, and I'm not going to claim to be an, an expert on regulations, um, but what I've read about Robinhood um, has a lot to do with the way that the company actually earns, I think, somewhere around 80% of their profits, which is not from the transactions that investors buying and selling would, would incur. And, and that would be the typical uh, form of revenue for uh, a trading platform. People you have to pay to use their platform. And, and that's, and, and it's, it seems like a fair deal to pay somebody to execute these transactions for you. But what Robinhood does is um, it's, it has to do with order flow, um, meaning that um, the firms out there, um, which would be like market making firms, meaning that they're the ones that are taking the other side of an investor's trade. Um, and they're competing for investors' trades, right? Because they make a fractional, fractional amount of money and many, many, many times over per second, probably. And so what Robinhood does is routes the investors' orders to one of these firms or another and, um, and earns a profit from that. And I think regulators are struggling to determine if that is a fair business practice. Um, you'll often hear regulators tend to be a... a you know, I shouldn't say behind the curve, so to speak, but these are complicated businesses with complicated transactions going on underneath. And, 
you kind of have to be uh, an expert to, to really have a clear picture into what's going on underneath the hood here. But at the end of the day, I think it's, I think that a lot of, um, a lot of these excesses so regulators are struggling to deal with because um, frankly, they're new. Uh, it's based on new technology and their new types uh, of business models. And we'll just have to kind of wait and see uh, where they land on this. Um, okay. it, it's still TBD. All right. Well, and, and we'll jump to the next conversation, which we're going to talk a little bit about oil in a moment. I just want to, um, I, I get daily information that I, I love reading. One of them was on the makeup of the trades at Robinhood. Uh, 33% of their trades are in crypto, some kind of crypto uh, trade that's going on. Uh, that is, again, an unregulated, uh, I don't even know that it should be called a security. Uh, whatever you want to call crypto, digital, meme stocks, whatever whatever name you want to apply to them, uh, that's a large part of their business, which, uh, again, so personally, I, I love technology. I love being on the cutting edge. I don't know that this is the cutting edge other than it may be a cut, and I want to uh, avoid that if possible, personally. Yeah, it's uh, interesting you bring up cryptocurrency, and, and again, this is an asset. Um, in fact, people have struggled defining whether it's an asset, whether it's a currency, um, you know, whether it's a technology, as you put it. Um, I, I, I don't know where I even sit on that yet, but um, it's not something that, you know, Morningstar is interested in investing in at this point. Um, you know, it's, but that's, it's a highly speculative uh, proposition to, to be trading um, in that, especially if you are, uh, you know, an, a novice investor. And let's face it, I think a lot of the people um, demographic wise um, are, are fairly new uh, to investing uh, that are on Robinhood right now. There so, you go. So it, it's an interesting, yeah. uh, it's interesting to watch because it will have an impact on all of us. That that's, mm -hmm. and we, when I say will have an impact, if it, if it goes wrong, uh, then it has a negative impact on, we'll, we'll say the regular uh, traditional investor. And I don't want it to have an impact on the regular traditional investor that want, doesn't want anything to do with this at this point. So it's, it is an interesting conversation. I think the regulators, have a lot of work to do in that in that regard. Uh, the oil industry, uh, we'll take just a few minutes on, on this. Uh, valuations, where we see it going, uh, it's certainly been uh, a headline uh, topic, uh, I would say uh, before the recent uh, more political uh, headline topics. And where do you see oil going and how does it fit into um, uh, environmental, social governance investing in your opinion? Yeah. Um, so I, I actually have an, an interesting kind of transition uh, that I just thought of going from the tech conversation to oil. Um, we did this piece recently at Morningstar that compared um, individual Fangham names. Um, so that's six companies in that acronym. Um, and four of the six by themselves have a market cap, so a kind of a market valuation greater than the entire global energy sector, which is a staggering, you know, we're talking trillions here, um, single digit trillions, but still that's kind of a, kind of blew my mind to see that. I mean, it's not just one company, it's not the sum total of those companies, it's one, four individual of those companies, uh, you know, are, are worth more than the entire global energy sector. So. It kind of puts things into perspective. I think 20, 30 years ago, um, a single name in the energy sector was the biggest company uh, in the U.S., I think, in the global market. Um, and so it's, it's been quite a, quite a shift <laughs> in leadership, if, sure. if you will. Um, so generally speaking, the energy industry and the energy sector, um, you know, when we saw in, uh, you know, February, March, April of 2020, um, this shutdown in, in many parts of the global economy that had the biggest impact on, on a couple sectors and energy in particular was hit quite hard. Um, when you think of an economic slowdown, um, that's not just talking about you and me and, and our, our family is going out and driving to the store or taking vacations in our cars. It's talking about all the shipping and all the trucking and all the planes traveling around the globe, all, you know, all hours of the day. 
that all kind of came to, you know, a, a huge slowdown too. And that of course all runs on, well, fossil fuels mostly. And so the energy sector took the biggest hit out of any of the, of the sectors. And in our view, um, that provided a, a very attractive opportunity. Uh, in fact, the energy sector, and we break it out a couple of ways, global, US, um, and then the pipeline companies, the, the master limited partnerships that don't own any oil or natural gas, but they just charge a, a fee for transporting it effectively. And, and so all those types of companies that took um, a major hit um, early in 2020, we found quite attractive. Um, and so we did take some dedicated positions um, just broadly across the sector. Now, coming out of that downturn, um, you know, energy markets, uh, or I should say the energy sector um, performed quite well. So towards the end of 2020 into the early part of this year, um, you know, that was the, out, the top performing sector, energy and financials outperformed the rest of the market. Um, and so, you know, our expected returns in those sectors has come down since, um, but uh, we do still see some value there. Um, it, they've, if it's pulled back a little bit, the energy market in particular, or the energy sector in particular. And so we still find it to, on a relative basis to other parts of the U.S. market in particular, we do find uh, the energy sector to be attractive right now. Okay. And, and environmental social governance, uh, we've used a couple of acronyms here, ESG. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's environmental, social governance, and that meaning uh, securities that are are considered uh, socially uh, responsible in some way. Are you fitting oil stocks into the ESG uh, uh, realm of investing, or are, are so? Is Morningstar's opinion they do fit in? Because uh, as an example, British Petroleum gives over a billion dollars a year to various. Uh, uh, charitable organizations or just uh, uh, efforts to to clean up oceans, land, whatever it may be. So do they fit in under that category at Morningstar? Yeah, so that's a, it's a, it's a fairly complicated issue, right? Because there's really not a consensus uh, yet not. anyways on what sustainability means. Sustainability is, is kind of synonymous with ESG, although you could nitpick and, and talk about the differences. But you know, I, the way I guess I think about it and the way we've been trying to think about it at Morningstar is uh, kind of in, you know, in our, in our non-ESG oriented portfolios. So these would be portfolios that are, that have managers within them that um, don't take an explicit um, focus on, on ESG risk or anything like that. Um, we do see energy as, as attractive. As I mentioned, it was uh, a dedicated position in, in, in a lot of our portfolios, but in our ESG focused portfolios, um, we do give the, the individual fund managers within those portfolios some latitude. Um, and, and generally speaking, we want them to integrate explicitly ESG considerations um, into their investment process. But if they determine that there's an, you know, an attractive energy company that, you know, and in an environmental sense, probably you could argue that any fossil fuel company is, is, is not good, right? But you can also talk about what's the best in class energy company. And you mentioned one that, you know, has a lot of social, social has been fairly socially responsible. That's another kind of lens other than the environmental, but um, you can take a best in class kind of viewpoint on things, or you could just say, you know what? all energy is, is, is out of the question in our portfolios. And, and again, we kind of give our managers some latitude to do what they do best. And that's manage our portfolios with, with ESG, um, you know, considered in their investment process. So on part net, of the process, but not necessarily dictating where it is you'll invest. It's yeah, it's not a strict exclusion, um, but they, it is a major component of their investment process. Right. And, 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 and on net, in our ESG oriented portfolios, you will see much lower energy exposure than in our non ESG portfolios or in your average portfolio. Um, and that's just kind of, you know, the result of kind of the first point I made that, that it's the environmental impact primarily that's driving that. Right. Okay. And I just, uh, Alina, uh, put together a wonderful, um, 
survey for our clients, which they filled in. And when now we're, we have that information, uh, the conversation or the, the there was a question there regarding uh, socially responsible investing. Uh, and I'm going to hold on to those results uh, from clients at this point. But I will say that uh, there's some interest in it. And I think it fits with the current, again, tone of conversation that it's building its momentum, but it's not something that is necessarily there yet. I would like to talk about something that is there and with about, uh, I'll just let everybody know with about 10 minutes to go, uh, Jeff and I are going to talk for a moment here about uh, the Delta variant, um, possibly the Delta Plus, but uh, I, I broke that news to Jeff just a mo few moments ago. So maybe we'll leave that one out. But the Delta variant, how it applies to pharma uh, in general. And also I know uh, Jeff is good enough and Morningstar are good enough to give us some outlooks on the stock market. So we're going to take uh, a few minutes on that to close things out. So if you would, Jeff, just uh, overall, uh, COVID, Delta variant, what it means to the pharma industry, give us a broad uh, perspective on that, please. Yeah, so it's been an, a, obviously a, a top on top of investors' minds, um, just in general, right? It's hard to talk about the markets and not talk about what's going on with COVID and and health and vaccines and, and and you name it, but you know the way we've kind of see things is uh, and the way kind of we've seen across the industry, um, COVID is definitely less of a concern now uh, than it was when we had this huge uncertainty last year and, and really kind of we didn't know, you know how much it was how long it was going to last with the kind of kind of ramp up period the vaccines how long that was going to take and so forth. We don't see. Um, you know, the Delta variant or, or the Delta variant plus, at least at this point, having that kind of outsized impact uh, on the market. Um, we don't we don't foresee these mass shutdowns and draconian measures um, that were required um, last year. Um, but the effect on big pharma, you know, I, obviously there's some key names out there that you can think of. Um, you know, a lot of people on the call have probably been vaccinated, you know, by one of the, the big three or four company names out there. Um, and, um, you know, they stand to benefit, obviously, from, from the, um, you know, the, the vaccines that have rolled out, that continue to roll out, maybe, you know, and we're hearing more and more now about booster shots. And so um, that's, that's going to be something that we have to deal with going forward. Um, but again, we don't see, we don't foresee um, the Delta variant and, and you now Delta Plus or whatever kind of um, iterations come down the line. Having that kind of, it won't be as big of a market surprise, I think, is, is kind of the, is the messaging that I, that I would kind of think about. Um, there's less uncertainty now that we've kind of been through this um, already. Sure. Um, there are some um, interesting companies, uh, and I'm not going to name names here because we do hold a couple of, of pharma names in one of our equity portfolios now that tends to focus on more high growth um, companies, growth companies that have uh, higher earnings growth. Um, but there's some interesting pharma companies that have really made some uh, progress in that mRNA technology that you hear about that's associated um, with Pfizer and Moderna. Um, and um, it's not just applicable to vaccines. There's all sorts of practical applications. Um, and so um, it is a new technology. It's, it's a technology that's under a lot of active development, and research and development. Um, but um, there's some interesting applications and, and some interesting companies to look at out there. And so we've definitely got our eye on that, um, you know, over the long term. We're not looking just at this current health issue that we've been experiencing, but um, additional applications down the road that could affect um, society for you know a longer period. And I, I just want to point this out about Morningstar and the relationship with Tranquility Financial Advisor, those clients that hold Morningstar, that's exactly why you're part of some client portfolios, that kind of outlook, that kind of work, it's different. And I've talked with clients uh, and, and part of what working with, with uh, Tranquility Financial Advisor is about is I look for investment firms like a Morningstar and Horizon Investments and Beacon Capital Management who are doing things uh, after I've looked into them in what I consider a different way. So that that is that is that is a great piece right there, Jeff. That you are looking at these companies, looking at uh, that are working on this new technology within the uh, research and development uh, and pharma and what what it, what is to come. Uh, I'm reading Codebreaker right now, so it fits in 
perfect the code breaker, uh, which is it fits in perfectly with that. But we we can't too, spend too much time on that. Mm-hmm. So. Last but not least, a market outlook for us, Jeff. Please, this is part of the work that Morningstar is doing and, and something that I appreciate about you is the, the color that you will add to uh, the conversation as it applies to U.S. stocks and bonds. Uh, moving forward, uh, we talked about it at the beginning, but but let's let's look forward. We're, we're in late August here. Uh, we'll close out the year. U.S. stocks, overall perspective, uh, and if, if you would, just a moment or two on non-U.S. based stocks as well. Sure. So I'll start with the economy. Um, that's kind of the what you know what drives the the markets to a, to a large extent. Um, the U.S. economy has had a tremendous economic recovery. Um, you know, we talk about real GDP or just economic growth. Um, grew at uh, a 6.4 annualized percent uh, just in the first quarter of this year. Um, actually, yeah, I haven't, I don't have a, the, the number for Q2. I'm not sh- I forget if it's been released yet, but strong economic growth so far year to date. Um, and we're forecasting, um, you know, growth rates uh, finishing the year of over 6%. And so to put things into perspective, you know, two to 3% um, roughly is, is probably the historical average. So we're talking about a big boost, uh, but again, coming from um, you know base effects of, of low growth um, at, at the same period last year. And then looking forward into 2022, we still see above average growth in, in the U.S. economy of, of roughly 4% at this point. Um, after 2022, probably uh, normalizing a little bit down, uh, trending down to more its long-term trend. Um, on the interest rate front, um, again, interest rates affect, directly affect stock valuations, bond valuations. Um, it, it's a big kind of link between the real economy and um, the uh, the markets um, or the capital markets, if you will. Um, so they're historically low by his, you know, based on long periods of time. I think. The ten-year Treasury, as long-term average, is somewhere around six percent, um, and right now we're, you know, just over one percent. I think one and a quarter, one and one point three, or something like that. Um, so we do see the Fed keeping interest rates pretty low for the for the the near to medium term. So probably through keeping short-term interest rates pretty low through twenty twenty three, um, but we do see long-term rates continuing to drift up, upwards. So when I say short-term, I'm talking about you know. The Fed, the, the Fed overnight bank rate, borrowing, is, right? Yeah, yeah, which is the one that's like at zero right now. Um, so, how does that affect markets? Um, so, generally speaking, we see the U.S. market that's had this huge run up as as being potentially overvalued in our view right now. Um, now, that's not to say that we just look at the market in, in total. Um, we think that valuations in the U.S. market have become skewed by these mega, ta- mega cap tech companies that we spoke, we've been speaking about. Um, there certainly are parts of the market that are more attractive than others. Um, energy and financials, to name two sectors that we do find attractive right now, and that we we have um, some kind of de- we have some dedicated exposure to in our multi asset portfolios. Um, we tend to be favoring right now value oriented companies or the ones that are less growth uh, or less focused on high growth and, and more um, cyclical exposure. Um, and part of the rationale there is that, you know, these growth companies have had some uh, astounding performance, which, you know, we, we feel leaves um, some valuation left untapped in, in, in the value side of the markets. Um, but also because the, a lot of the value companies, energy and financials in particular, tend to benefit from an economic recovery. I talked about how energy kind of runs commerce. And so the more economic activity there is, the more um, you know, profits uh, that they stand to make. And, and similarly on the, on the financial side, banks, right? When, when the economy is expanding, um, businesses see opportunities, they need money to fund those opportunities, they go to banks for that and so forth. So all the economic activity and the increase of it, um, those two sectors do stand to benefit. Um, all else, you know, everything equal, you know, saying that the, the U.S. economy or the U.S. stock market, we feel 
could be a little bit overvalued at this point in time. We do see some nice opportunities in non-US markets. Um, we take pretty dedicated exposures in specific countries. Uh, we don't just kind of invest in the non-US market, uh, so to speak. So there are certain countries in certain sectors and certain in those countries that we like. Um, I can think of um, like the UK, for example, is, is, is an attractive opportunity in our view. Um, and, and a handful of others. South Korea is another name that we like right now. And so we do have some dedicated exposures in specific countries and sectors outside of the U.S. All right. And now, um, obviously, that, that's not in all of your portfolios. Those are portfolios that uh, specifically allow for investing outside the U.S. And are, are you directly investing or is it uh, American depository receipts that you invest in? Yeah. And that's that's actually I'm glad that you mentioned that um, I'm kind of flipping around in terms of what what portfolios I'm thinking of when I'm speaking. Um, we do have all equity portfolios that invest in specific stocks. Um, and if it's a, if it's a U.S. large cap focused um, account, obviously we're not taking these, um, you know, country or non-U.S. exposures that I'm speaking of. Um, we do have an international equity portfolio that it does primarily, as you said, invest in internet in ADRs, which is just basically a way um, for foreign companies to trade on U.S. exchanges. So we, we trade through U.S. exchanges when we buy those companies. I'm just going to um, take a moment, Jeff, yep. uh, so that we don't speak financial advisor. We always want to make sure that uh, uh, ADR isn't a term that everyone here is thinking of each day. Uh, ADR would be like you own a share of a share. You own proof that you own shares of a stock in a foreign country. So, uh, so that's what an ADR is. Uh, you don't own the actual stock. You own proof that you hold the stock in an account or uh, that is held in a country like you brought up South Korea, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good way to think about it. I usually talk about it in terms of where like, it trades on a U.S. exchange rather than a foreign uh, located exchange, but that also is another way to think about it. And, you know, let's face it, at the end of the day, all, almost all financial transactions are a contract. Um, you don't own any physical That's correct. anything uh, anymore. anymore. So it is a little bit more removed in that regard, but um, it's, it's, uh, it's the way the reg, it's the way the, you know, that the market has kind of structured things to, to allow investments across borders. Um, so if I can summarize a positive outlook, towards the end of the year, but there are sectors of concern, uh, but then you, mm. you, you still see plenty of opportunity out there. And it really is in, in Morningstar's uh, world, your work to go find that opportunity for the people that have chosen to work with Morningstar. That's a good way to put it. We are constantly scouring the, all sorts of different markets and, and really at the end of the day, comparing what we think they're worth to what the uh, market is pricing them. Uh, and that we let that guide us in terms of which um, which parts of the market or even which companies are more attractive than others. So that's a good way to think about our process. And, um, you know, we're not always going to be right. Uh, but we think that we, we think that on net, if we comply, if we can apply a consistent, and repeatable and uh, rational process on a repeated basis that, uh, that we, that investors stand to benefit, um, in our view. So, well, and I'm with you all the way and I, we're going to leave it right there, but I will leave it with this. That's part of the reason we work together. Uh, I, I have a set of questions, a set of, 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 well, framework of, of what I look for when interviewing different money managers and Jeff, as you can imagine, and clients can imagine, I'm under constant barrage of new investment firms wanting to talk with me. And one of the things that, uh, one, just one of the things about Morningstar that I appreciate is that dedication to the process that uh, when things went south in 2020, uh, quickly, you did not abandon your process. Uh, we knew what to expect. Uh, we knew how you would handle it. That is that is what I'm looking for. If we're, if we're hiring you to do this work, you do it in it, during the bad and the good because that consistent, consistency is something that as the advisor I can rely on. And of course, uh, as, as clients, uh, it can be relied upon as well. No one's expecting you to be right 100% of the time. That would be um, an, an unfair expectation. It's just that repeatable, consistent process is something that we do rely upon. So with that, Jeff, I want to thank you for just over 50 minutes here. I want to thank Alina and Andrew as well. I know they uh, sat and watched this one. I wanted everyone that's here with us watching, those of you uh, 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 
viewing this after on the recording, uh, I just wanted everybody to see Alina and Andrew. They're doing great work for Tranquility Financial Advisor. You will be receiving emails from them. So, uh, Jeff, with that, thank you so much. And everyone uh, here now listening, thank you. And, uh, and we, will, we will host a few more uh, during the fall and into the winter. All right. Thank you. Appreciate your business and uh, look forward to speaking again. A pleasure. Thanks. All right. With today's meeting, I do have to read uh, our long disclosure. So uh, I'll jump to that. Today is uh, August 20th, 2021. I'm joined by uh, Jeff Wagner of Morningstar Investments. Uh, we'll jump right to it with our disclosure. And of course, uh, this will be at the beginning of our video conference and at the end. So if you really want to read this over, uh, you're certainly welcome to do so and appreciate you being here and uh, viewing the webinar. Lewis Tranquilly is an investment advisor representative of Tranquilly Financial Advisor, LLC. This content is provided for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice or a recommendation to buy or sell any type of securities. Neither Mr. Tranquilly nor Tranquilly Financial Advisor, LLC, and Morningstar Investment Management, LLC, are responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken as a result of the information provided here and do not warrant or guarantee the accuracy or completeness of the information provided. The information discussed here reflects the views of Mr. Tranquilly, me, and my guest, Jeff Wagner, as of today's date of this show and are subject to change without notice. Clients of Tranquility Financial Advisor, LLC, may hold positions in securities discussed during this video conference. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Any forward-looking statements or forecasts are based on assumptions and, are, and actual results may vary from any such statements or forecasts. No reliance should be placed on any statement or forecast when making any investment decision. Accordingly, viewers should not rely solely on the information provided in this video in making any investment decision. There's a risk of loss from investing in securities, including the risk of loss of principal. Different types of investments involve varying degrees of risk, and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will be profitable or suitable for a particular investor's financial situation or risk tolerance. Asset allocation and portfolio diversification diversification cannot assure or guarantee better performance and cannot eliminate the risk of investment losses. Jeff Wagner is a portfolio specialist at Morningstar Investment Management, LLC, a registered investment advisor and a wholly owned subsidiary of Morningstar Incorporated. The Morningstar strategies referred to within this show are offered by Morningstar Investment Management. Diversification and asset allocation are investment methods used to help manage risk. They do not ensure a profit or protect against the loss. Opinions of Morningstar Investment Management are subject to change and are provided for informational purposes only. References to specific securities should not be considered an offer to purchase or sell that investment. Morningstar Investment Management shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to this information, data, analysis, or opinions of their use. This information is for informational purposes only and has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or needs of any specific listener and should not be considered investment advice. Consult a financial professional for advice specific to your individual circumstances. Morningstar Investment Management and its subsidiaries are not affiliated with Tranquility Financial Advisor, LLC. Thank you for sitting through that long uh, disclosure. We're glad to have Jeff with us. Uh, appreciate his time. And, uh, and certainly appreciate all of you being here and uh, we'll get to it. Mm -hmm. 